Good afternoon, and welcome to our latest Well Connect Wednesdays. Today, we're going to be talking with Drs. Deep Sharma and Nadim Iklak about our comprehensive lung cancer care program that we have at Columbus Regional Health. Doctors, welcome, and thank you both for joining us. This isn't your first time, so thanks for coming back to us on this platform. Glad thanks for having us. Uh, Dr. Sharma, let's start with you. Just a, another quick brief introduction for those who may not know you. Uh, I'm Deep Sharma. I'm an interventional hormonologist at CRH, uh, also the director of uh, Lung Institute and Intensive Care Unit. And Dr. Eklak? I'm Nadeem Eklak. I'm a medical oncologist, um, uh, and uh, I mainly treat lung cancers. That's not only my profession, but more like my passion. Great. Thank you, guys. So we're coming off the heels of Lung Cancer Awareness Month. But obviously, you're both living this 24-7, 365, in your dreams. Uh, it's both a passion for you. We have a dynamic duo between the two of you here today. So let's get started with just some kind of setting the stage. What is our lung cancer prevalence in the area? Um, and what does that mean from your perspectives? So we uh, definitely have higher prevalence and incidence of lung cancer in our area compared to the national average. Uh, part of this has to do with our smoking rates uh, and other factors, of course. But we have traditionally seen about twice uh, the incidence in our area compared to the national uh, lung cancer screening numbers that we have. So our incidence range between about 2.25 to 3 percent, uh, where the average is about 1.25 uh, to less than 1.5 for sure. So. You know, twice uh, the national average, and then we both see uh, a lot of patients uh, coming through our screening program, and then traditionally also uh, coming a little bit later in the state. So definitely something that uh, is prevalent and, and affects a lot of uh, patients, uh, particularly in this uh, Kentucky, Indiana belt. Unfortunately, we are making lots of progress uh, in terms of early detection. But unfortunately, still nationwide, uh, lung cancer is uh, one of the most challenging uh, disease to treat. Uh, nationwide, still in 2021, about 235,000 people were supposed to be diagnosed uh, with lung cancer. About 80% or just slightly higher than that belong to a category, category called non-small cell lung cancer. And truth of the matter is that despite of all the advances, still one third of cancer related deaths are only related to lung cancer. Prevalence is still high. Uh, fortunately, it is slowly, very slightly going downhill. But unfortunately, in our area, just because smoking prevalence is much higher than in some of the other states of the uh, United States, we see much more prevalence of disease in this belt. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So lung cancer is, is one of the leading, if not the leading, among other cancers. But there's some hope there because really the big thing is the earlier we catch it, the I mean, it has huge effects on the potential to treat different treatment options um, and survivorship. So let's dive right into it. You know, uh, what is the best preventative tool um, what can we do or what can we encourage patients to do to kind of prevent that late stage lung cancer that's harder to treat? Yeah, so Kelsey, for the, for the first point, you know, as you said, it is definitely one of the leading causes of death as Dr. Eklak just shared some numbers as well. So lung cancer by itself kills more people than prostate, breast, and colon combined. Uh, so just to give you a magnitude of the impact it has on, on health care. Uh, and then the second thing is the prevention, uh, which is, you know, the factors that can prevent is, again, smoking related, which is, again, 80 uh, percent directly or indirectly related to any of the lung cancers that get diagnosed. Uh, so avoiding those factors will help with prevention. But the biggest thing that we talk about during Lung Cancer Awareness Month is early detection. Uh, which has huge impact on survivability and, and treatment options. Uh, and the best measure to do that is, uh, is our screening tool uh, that we have. Uh, and it's a, it's a newer tool. It just came out in 2013. So it's compared to the mammogram and colonoscopy, it's, it's much newer. So it's still evolving. 
uh, but it has definitely shown uh, increased survivability and, and improved mortality. Um, so as Dr. A. Clark said, the majority of the patients get diagnosed in late stage, and the national number is about 80% are diagnosed in, in late stage, but we know if people going through screening program, the number is kind of reverse. Uh, about 70 to 80% get diagnosed in early stage, uh, which uh, has improved survivability, uh, success rate, and then uh, expectancy uh, of life uh, if detected in early stage than later. Right. Look, for years and years, we were um, trying to come up with a, a way to detect lung cancer at an early stage. We know very well that by the time symptoms start, majority of the time cancer is already advanced. So symptoms like chest pain, increasing shortness of breath, coughing up blood, weight loss, change in appetite, all those things, when, when they, uh, those things come on at the table, it means we are already, most majority of the time, dealing with advanced stage. So the target was to detect and come up with a treatment plan for patients uh, with lung cancer before they suffer from any symptoms. And we, we know that if we can pick that at that level, there are actually very effective curative treatments in those situations. That's why after multiple trials in 2013, we came up with this low-dose CT, uh, CT scan screening uh, for high-risk population. And it turned out that over last the last several years, now about 80 years, it made a huge difference um, in terms of numbers of detecting lung cancer at an early stage and offering them a curative treatment. And that's why that's where we saw a you know a very impressive and growing role of interventional pulmonology, you know, where cancer staging was just not or lung cancer staging was just not limited to the scans but actually seeing the disease uh, through the scope and able to prove or, or rule out any disease made a big difference for me um, as a cancer treatment doctor, uh, what Dr. Deep and, and uh, Dr. Sharma and his team do, you know, it made my decisions much more obje objective and much more beneficial for the patients. So let's talk about those things. I think that's very important because that was that is just a game changing in the treatment of lung cancer. How to detect a lung cancer at an early stage once we find a suspicious shadow or a nodule on a low dose CT screen or even on an X-ray? Right. Yeah. So, thanks for the introduction to the interventional pulmonary uh, field. So, as Dr. Eklak said, that definitely a newer field. Uh, we had no concept of interventional pulmonology. You know, ten years back and now it's a rapidly growing field uh, and all it's focused on is most of it is early detection uh, and you know giving information to cancer doctors like Dr. Eklak so he can use that and then decide what are the best treatment option for the patients are uh, and so far you know prior to I would say 2013 most of the cancers were being diagnosed late stage so already advanced multiple organs are involved or mass is again really big and and the point after that was to detect them at smaller and smaller stages uh, earlier stages when they're size of a quarter or even a dime um, so it Initially, we only had limited tools, but now with advancement in technology, we have instruments like our robotic, robotic navigation system. Um, that's one of the most advanced machines out there, along with our cone beam CT. So combining these two, uh, you know, I am able to go into patient's lung and then travel inside using the natural breathing tubes and then go to these suspicious uh, nodules, lesions, and then find out are these early cancers, are these some things, this infection, are we, do we need to act on it? Do we need to get them uh, resected or, or radiated uh, well, versus, okay, these are not cancers, and then we can tell that patient, and so they stop worrying about it. So getting an actual answer uh, and then getting all the information that our oncologists use to decide chemotherapy, immunotherapy, so all that became more and more important. <clears throat> 
Yeah, and this is, you know, it's really, this is the new ION program that we have that, that you're talking about in part, but, you know, this sounds very technical, and it is, but it's not considered an evasive procedure. I mean, you're not having to open up someone's chest. You know, this is something that's very manageable for the patient to receive and, and continue with some quality of life. I mean, it's, it's an outpatient procedure. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So 98 to 99% of our patients go home a uh, couple of hours after the procedure is done. Uh, it definitely takes longer time uh, because it is uh, minimally invasive. So you have to be careful. You have to, uh, rather than opening up the chest and going straight to it, you have to, you know, fine tune and maneuver your way to that spot. So it takes, it is technically more challenging, but from patient perspective, much more tolerable, extremely less uh, risk, fa risk for uh, complications. Uh, less than 2%, and as I said, 99% of the patients go home uh, the same day, and the rest 1% go home the next day. Wow. So let's talk a little bit more um, broadly about, you know, this comprehensive approach, the two of you. So if someone does have a scan, is that, you know, that's typically going to be where it starts with a scan? Okay. Usually. And, and we have our lung nodule review board, so explain a little bit about what that is and, and the, the perspectives that you both bring to it and the other physicians involved as right. well. So... One thing which we learned over a period of last several years is um, lung cancer treatment, it is a multidisciplinary treatment approach. We noticed that uh, um, a scan can be interpreted differently from the eye of a medical oncologist to a radiation oncologist to a surgical oncologist to a pulmonologist. And that led to the need of a multidisciplinary meeting where we all can sit together and look at the scans together and make the arguments about what would be the best approach in this situation and convince each other. It turned out to be the most effective approach uh, for the management of early stage lung cancer patients. Uh, we see that because of that combined modality approach, we can offer curative treatment to more and more patients as compared to patients are being seen by one specialty at one time. And that was the difference which our program made over the last several years and uh, since I joined the team is to emphasize on this fact that lung cancer treatment is a multidisciplinary treatment. So a lung nodule um, was seen on a CT scan incidentally. Majority of the time, it is an incidental diagnosis. As I said, these patients do not have symptoms uh, during the early stage of lung cancer. We review the scan, so we make a plan, we discuss it, okay. First thing is obviously diagno diagnosis. We have great diagnostic tools now at our institution. Uh, all cutting edge technology to come up with the right and timely diagnosis. Remember, this, di this suspicion of uh, having a cancer provoke a lot of anxiety in patients and family. So a timely intervention is of a, sometimes of an utmost importance uh, to either relieve all of them that no, we are not dealing with cancer, or if it is, then okay, we have a diagnosis, let's talk about the treatment options. Um, and that's where the, the Lung Cancer Institute works here. That's how it works, bringing those patients in a very timely manner and able to provide our services to make a diagnosis. And then it comes down to what would be the best treatment in those situations, which will um, uh, Put shed light in a few minutes, but certainly that also involved multidisciplinary approach and discussions that uh, what would be the best treatment here. Yeah, absolutely. We, we talk about yeah. providing that peace of mind to our patients. Dr. Sharma, I was going to ask, you know, after someone's uh, who's a candidate for the procedure you're talking about, um, you know, kind of what, what, can, what can the patient expect moving through that process? And then once it's completed, the communication with you, um, what you're finding in real time, the importance of being able to have that here in town and not having to go somewhere for that. Yeah, I think as Dr. Eklak said, the, the, the biggest thing is having the right diagnosis. So you have to be accurate, uh, but also timely. Uh, and you know, those are the two pieces which are the most important uh, for the, the patient uh, who's going through that process. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety involved, and then there's a lot of 
information overload and you know it's very easy to get lost and think of worst case scenario and then go down that path so from our standpoint you know as our direct like said multidisciplinary approach i mean that's the most important thing that has shown the best uh, benefit in terms of outcomes so you know i'll take a step back so when we're in the screening process and we have a ct you know multiple specialities uh, oncology pulmonology our radiologists radiation oncology we all are looking at it at the same time and that's even before the patient has seen any of us in person so this is all happening in, in the, the backstage uh, trying to come up with the best possible approach without even patient you know coming to the clinic and then once that's decided and let's say it's best for a patient to get a biopsy. What we usually do is just uh, have the patient come see us in the in the lung institute, uh, talk about the procedure in person, uh, go through the logistics, and then we try to schedule everyone you know as soon as possible. Uh, and on the day of procedure, again, you know it's a outpatient procedure takes two hours. Uh, fortunately, we have on-site pathology, so while we are taking the biopsies and 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 getting the tissue, our pathologists are right there looking at it and processing it. Uh, and on-site cytology is one of, again, those things that play a huge role in it. So we are fortunate to have that. And I would say 90, 95% of the time, we have some sort of diagnosis on the same day, even before we finish the procedure. And we are able to share that with the patient. Uh, and that's usually three or four or five days sooner than what the formal report comes. So. Uh, and that allows us to, again, get the process going further. You know, if we have a diagnosis, it looks like non-small cell lung cancer. We know this patient has one spot. Lymph nodes are negative. Uh, in that case, I'm all, you know, able to start the process for a patient to see a surgeon or see a radiation oncologist. And we're already thinking about two steps down the line. Uh, even before we have finalized anything uh, formally. Uh, or if it's otherwise and we feel like the patient has advanced diagnosis, then we are already talking to our oncology team uh, and then you know Dr. Eklag is already reviewing stuff and he's asking or telling pathologists what specific tests he needs. So they are already working on that to give him the answer. So by the time patient comes and sees the next set of physician, the plan is already, you know, ninety percent said in terms of what would be the best for the patient. Uh, and as I said, most of it goes in the backstage so that we can keep it timely, uh, keep the logistics to the minimum, and then keep the patient, you know, away from all the anxiety-provoking factors. Absolutely. And you kind of spoke to this um, before, Dr. Icklock, but so, you know, the information that Dr. Sharma is gathering, giving to you guys now, you're literally just steps away from each other. But kind of talk about how um, your process works between each other with oncology, what you're looking for that helps inform your decisions and all that. Sure. So I think, as I said, uh, um, the diagnosis or even suspicion of cancer provokes a lot of anxiety. So... Honestly, I feel that it is actually uh, a great service uh, available locally in this community uh, and the surrounding areas where people do not have to drive far and get all the treatment, diagnosis and treatment right here in our institution, right at the doorstep. Now, so what we do is once we get the diagnosis, uh, we come up with a plan of treatment after knowing what is the stage of this cancer. We exhaust all our efforts uh, before we say that this is an advanced stage cancer. So not only the scans, but also the biopsies of those lymph nodes, which are surrounding the suspicious area, are very important for us. And that's where interventional pulmonary team can bring that, that piece that we can be for sure. Sometimes PET scan or CT scan come up with false positive or false negative results. And that's where that can potentially lead to a wrong management. And it is very important to be completely certain about the stage of that cancer. So after knowing that this is an early stage, we try our best to offer that person a curative treatment, either in the form of a surgical resection, if he otherwise carries healthy lung, or in the form of a very focused radiation therapy, which is also part of the team at our institution. We do have very um, 
cutting edge uh, radiation oncologist who knows exactly what to do. Um, pretty much all type of cancers, but very special interest in lung cancers. Um, so in other cases where we know that these patient, this patient has an advanced stage, okay? unfortunately, it is not uh, an uncommon thing in lung cancer world uh, to find an advanced stage lung cancer. Then I will still rely on our bronchoscopy and, and our, our, uh, our tissue biopsies uh, because we totally change the way we manage advanced lung cancers during last five years. Um, it's actually just a complete evolution in the treatment of lung cancer in advanced stage. Um, now we don't even start any treatment till we know the specific tumor markers, specific proteins on the surface of the cancer cells, or we call it specific genes, um, till we know the status of those genes. With the newer technologies, um, the, those testings are getting more and more sensitive to pick up the genes. It made a huge difference in treatment of lung cancer where there is now a sizable number of patients um, uh, are not even getting any cytotoxic traditional chemotherapy at all. Either they are getting an oral pill or they are getting a uh, treatment or a class of drug called immune therapy, totally sparing them from all typical chemotherapy-related or traditional or historic chemotherapy-related side effects, um, as well as better results, more durable response. Um, you know, people like me who are living in lung cancer world for almost 20 years now, we never thought of lung cancer survival beyond one year in advanced stage. Now, you know, personally I have and nationally everywhere we see patients going beyond two years, three years, even in advanced setup. Not all, but there are a reasonable number of patients who, who are able to manage. And the only reason why it happened is the availability of specific target treatments and the newer treatments called immune therapies. Wow, fascinating, fascinating. Yeah, and, and you set that up really nicely for us. I, I will do a little plug here. We are taking questions for both the physicians here as we wrap up our, um, as our discussion wraps up. So please load those in the comments if you haven't already. But um, the last kind of question I was gonna ask you both, and we've talked about some already, but you know, new advancements that we have already or that you see coming in um, both of your fields, any, any others you'd like to point out? So I think for, for international pulmonary, the, the most advanced uh, two pieces of equipment we have is the robotic navigation uh, and the cone beam. Uh, so we were first five hospitals in the United States to launch the cone beam program uh, right. in our bronchoscopy world. Uh, we have already done like more than 200 cases. Um, so we are far ahead of the curve. And then typically, you know, our diagnosis nationally would say 70, 75% is the accuracy. Uh, we have consistently been 90% uh, since we started the program here. And then the goal was to how do we get even 95 and above. So adding the robotic navigation, that gives me confidence that we can definitely get there. Um, and then, you know, get all the information in a minimally invasive manner. And then as Dr. Eklak said, it's, you know, it's that lesion, but also the lymph node surrounding and the other abnormalities. And then I tell all my patients, everything that we will see that looks like abnormal or may have an impact on the treatment, we are going to biopsy all that. So we want just one procedure uh, one time anesthesia. Uh, so, and there are approximately three, four, five different pieces of equipment that are involved uh, and multiple team members, but we try to get it all done in one. So for us, you know, combining robotic navigation and cone beam, you know, that's the uh, pinnacle of our diagnostic international pulmonary, uh, nationally or internationally. And, and that's, uh, we are at, you know, at par with that. So that just gives me a lot of confidence uh, also joy, uh, you know, that we have that opportunity to offer that to our to our patients. And uh, and it's not just like we are leading in the community, but also we are the only one in the state to have that uh, ability. Uh, so we can get all the answers that you know, Dr. Aklak and team need uh, to, to treat their patient. So 
uh, you know, just I always try, try to make it in a layman term. I tell patients, you know, uh, the lungs have a surface area of, of almost uh, a tennis court. And the spot we are going for is the size of a nickel, maybe a quarter. So, and then I have no vision. Uh, you know, my eyes are shut. So I have to find that quarter in a, in a tennis court without looking. So, so that's the complexity of, of the, this procedure is. Uh, but, you know, with the team that we have, I mean, we, we feel, I feel you know, really confident in, in what we are doing and how we are able to support our cancer patients and our oncology teams. Uh, so that's where we are, and I've always tried to stay at par with whatever is out there. Uh, and I think right now we just have to kind of fine tune uh, the technology we have, keep building on the experience, and then keep, you know, going towards that hundred percent accuracy. Yeah. Amazing, great. great, great. Okay, I have a couple of questions here. Um, they're kind of the same, and I'll, I'll go ahead and say just in general about the programs you've both spoken about, about our screening opportunities. Um, you can find more information on www.crh.org backslash lung. Um, okay, we have one question in the message. I quit smoking several years ago and don't have symptoms. How do I know if I should get a scan? So, uh, so there are three major uh, criteria, you know, defined by the uh, USPSTF, uh, which is the screening uh, uh, guideline uh, authority in, uh, for U.S. So, one is the age. Uh, so, if you are between 50 and 80 year old, uh, then you also calculate your pack years. So, take an average pack that you would smoke in a day, and then multiply by the number of years you smoke. So, if you smoke one pack and a day for 20 years, then that puts you at 20 pack years. And if you are at 20 pack years or more, and in the past or even currently, and if you have even quit within 15 years, then if you check all those three boxes, then you uh, qualify for a lung cancer screening. Okay, great. And that was that's perfectly that's reinforced there on the website that I mentioned as well. Um, now this is a, a specific uh, question from. Uh, patient, but we can go ahead and, and try to kind of tackle that. I had a scan in June um, that showed I had a very small nodule on my left lung. I have to go get another one December 8th. Do you think I will have to get a biopsy? So I guess what they're trying to talk about is what happens if you have a nodule on the scan. Uh, so not all patients need uh, for the workup, you know, if, if you look at our screening program, 80% of the patients did not need anything. It was only 20% of the patients who needed like an earlier scan. So if they had it in June and they're getting one in December, so that is a six month time period. So my guess would be this is a lung rat three. So the risk factor or the risk uh, of that lesion to be cancerous is divided into lung rats one, two, three, four. So this seems to fall in that three category and then we do six month scan. And then the next decision comes on how does the spot look on the next scan. So if there is any growth, uh, then yes, you know, biopsy, PET scans, those things come into play. If the nodule appears to be stable, then it will be just continuing uh, further uh, surveillance uh, until we deem it stable. And that's a great example of the team approach, you know, right. that Dr. Right. Gluck was talking about exactly. multiple yeah. uh, visions looking. Okay. Um, I've got one last one here, a, a minute left. Um, I, I am not a smoker. However, I do have trouble breathing. You mentioned trouble breathing as a reason to get a scan. How, I mean, this is kind of the same question, but how do I know if I should get a scan? So... Uh, trouble breathing does not really mean a reason to get a scan. Now, obviously, there are uh, there is a, there are a variety of reasons uh, to have uh, breathing difficulty. And I think this patient, if if he or she does have trouble breathing, first thing is to contact their primary care physician to get evaluated to see is the breathing issue related to her lungs or it is related to heart or is it related to some other disorder in the body? And then the primary care physician can guide uh, the patient accordingly, what would be the next step? So trouble breathing is a very vague statement and it can potentially be because of number of reasons. 
So I think first thing I would advise in those situations is to contact the primary care physician. Great. That's a great setup. I think we would um, like to say, you know, a, a referral is not needed for a scan. Um, it's, it's a low-cost scan. Um, we have the criteria that you outlined, Dr. Sharma, but we certainly do encourage people to consult with their primary care physician. If they feel they need a referral, they know they can reach right out to you guys. Um, and I'll go ahead and do a, a plug of our sponsor of these Well Connect Wednesdays. And if you don't have a primary care physician, our connection specialists at Well Connect are happy to help you find one or help you navigate our site to get the questions that you need uh, answered. So I think... That is all the questions we have for you two today. Thank you so much for going over this extensive content in great detail yeah. and um, providing a great snapshot of, of just the passion and expertise you both have for this field. So thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having us. And that concludes our latest session of Well Connect Wednesdays. Thanks so much for joining us.